This is Show Up as a Leader, a show from People Forward Network, helping you maximize your positive impact on the world by becoming your best, fully authentic self. Hey there, everybody. It's Rosie. My friends from Vital Work, Rebecca Johnson and Natalie Johnson, passionately help leaders and teams function at full capacity. This new series, Energy, Connection, and Courage at Work, breaks down those three elements essential to a thriving workplace. Take a listen. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Energy, Connection, and Courage at Work. I'm Rebecca Johnson, and we are doing a session today on courage in the workplace. It's actually going to be the second in a series we're doing on courage, because courage is a big topic. And today, we're going to be lasering in on the concept of humility. We have a great guest with us today. I'm going to turn it over to Natalie to introduce our guest, because Natalie knew her first. Nat, over to you. Thanks, Beth. I'm super excited today. We've been talking about doing this podcast for a long time. And our guest today, Chantra Powell, I had the honor of meeting Chantra. I think first, Chantra was an audience member in a virtual training that I did on energy. And as a as a coach and facilitator, I'm always looking for the people in the audience who have kind of that bright, wide-eyed look, and they look interested, and they look like they're into it, and they look like they're engaged. They're kind of my touch points of making eye contact with, and especially virtually, where it's just so hard to do that. And so Chantra was one of those people. She was the energetic, engaged person that I could see in the camera, and I was like, oh, her. Like, she is the one I'm talking to. Virtual is so difficult. And she was, she was engaged. She was asking great questions, had these great comments. And we continued that conversation offline. Later, we ended up doing a panel discussion at a conference that we did together down in Naples. And as we got to know each other more, we just learned so much about each other where we have a lot in common. And for me, I just have a lot of respect for Chantra as a leader in business as well as a, a leader in life and mom and and all those different things. And every time Chantra and I get together, we talk a lot. So it's going to be a little challenging to keep us brief today. But Chantra, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I think Rebecca is going to be like the referee. <laughs> I know. It might be. It might be. And I, I love our topic of humility today because Chantra has written a book. Her book is called Proven Not Perfect. Do I have that right? You do? Yes. Seven Truths of a Corporate Executive Mommy Wife Christian. Yeah, that's the book. 2018, the book that wrote me. Oh, I love it. And I, I've read the book, but I read what I learned is I read the first vis- version or the first edition, and there is a second edition. And I know that in the version that I was able to read, Um, It's been a little while because I read it right after I met you, but you have a chapter that's focused on humility. And we'd love to hear from you specifically how humility has played a part in your leadership. Yeah, thank you so much. So this is a real privilege. So humility for me, I would say, and and if I may, I'll go into story. So I'm one of those go-getters, have been for many, many years, starting my career in finance leadership and then having that progress to some of the world's top brands in fortune land. And so when I started my career, like most people, I started my career in that individual contributor lane where we all have that script of work hard, um, demonstrate your success, demonstrate your intellect, and let that drive you increasingly far in your journey and in your career. For me, that formula worked and it worked very well until I got to the place where then I was tapped to take on people leadership. For people leadership, I found myself going from managing mergers and acquisitions and leading deals to running a 250 person operation, commercial operation, managing talent ranging from hourly staff to direct staff including a staff in India offshore. My assignment, because I had been really good at executing, was to come into this organization that was 
a solid organization, but it certainly wasn't exemplifying some of the best practices that that corporation desired at that time, including KPIs and metrics being consistent and including driving some of the outcomes that were expected. So I show up full ready with my individual contributor, high intellect mindset, and I'm ready to get the job done. As the keys are given to me for this role, I had a staff of five. I walked in fully well knowing how I was motivated in my career and how I found success in my career. And quite frankly, expecting that was exactly the same way that everyone else was motivated and found success in their career. Within a short period of time, and I would say within 30 days, I was in a terrible way. So one of the best people on my leadership team, which I would come to learn, had tended their resignation. The next false person was actively interviewing and being recruited. And I was in a negotiation with another colleague on whether I would allow that person to leave or not. The person really wanted to go. The third person who was very content to stay was, I would say, not the A player on the team and very content with being the person in the middle. And the next two were marginal as well. And so here I am running this large organization, proving to my leadership that I could translate years of understanding into impact in this new leadership role. And I had no one following me. And the people that were supposed to be following me were trying desperately to get the hell out, right? That's humbling. <laughs> And for me, that became the turning point in my career and certainly my career as a leader. So what did I do? I can distinctly remember the day when all of this came crashing. I went into my office, I closed the door and I had a hard look at myself. The reality is I came in telling, certainly not selling. The next reality was there was really limited understanding for me about what the true motivators of the broader organization and team were. And quite frankly, I'd been so arrogant in my approach that I didn't even, I didn't even bother to care. So after looking in the mirror and accepting all that I'd done wrong, I had a choice. Either I was going to surrender to that and feel like a failure, or I was going to own and be accountable to what I was and seek to mend the relationships that I could. Started with my direct reports, pulled the team in, gave an honest report card on myself, and quite frankly, apologized. And then I asked what, if anything, I could do to keep the ones that were leaving and wanted to leave. Um, after tough 360 feedback real time, <laughs> um, I was able to successfully keep the majority of the team, the one that was out the door, she was gone. We spent time from that point on working to reestablish me as a leader in that business by pushing me out the way. I allowed them to reveal to me who that organization was, why the folks that worked there did, and what made them show up every day and be happy and motivated. And I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about others. And in fact, what I'm thinking as a motivator was an absolute demotivator. I had on the list, well, of course you want to be acknowledged for the corporate leadership program and go to the corporate leadership center, right? When in fact, the team that I was leading, many of them had no desire to go anywhere but into the office where we worked and be told that they were doing a great job. That was it. The other thing that I missed was a lot of competitors were in my group, right? So this notion of competition wasn't one against each other. It was a competition 
as a team because several of them actually spent their weekends doing fun um, semi-professional bowling activities, right? And so for them, thinking of camaraderie and bringing forward opportunities for bowling and camaraderie and competition in that way was a way to bond and to really take the relationships to the next level and to integrate myself into the culture. So that's that's a little bit about me and humility and how I think, you know, the courage that it takes to admit you're wrong, it's a really tough one. It's a tough pill, right? But I think there's no better pill to swallow because when you're willing to do that, it opens up doors, it opens up hearts, and then people actually allow you to become a leader. Chantra, that was such a good story. And as you were talking, I was thinking about this definition of humility from Timothy Clark that I heard maybe, I don't know, three or four months ago. And he defines humility, I'll see if I can get this right, as the unresented acceptance that you're dependent on other people and you don't know everything. And I was listening to you talk about what you did and you said all sorts of things that aligned with that. Like number one, I had to recognize that I didn't know what motivated people. I was making a lot of assumptions that it turns out were incorrect. I had to admit mistakes. I had to go to my team and acknowledge that we have to do this together. I can't do this alone. And I was thinking about how when when anyone on our team is doing leadership training with any client, one of the first things we will often do is just have people talk about, like, think about a great leader that you've worked with in the past. What makes them a great leader? And almost nobody says they were super, super smart. And gosh, they knew a lot about X, Y, Z. They name off these personal characteristics and attitudes and behaviors, which are an interesting blend of confidence and humility. And so I just found your story like such a real example of how leadership 100% requires humility and how people are not interested in being led by someone who who doesn't demonstrate that. Thank you for sharing that story with us. That was great. Well, you're very welcome. I think you said something too. Confidence, right? Because clearly it has to be present and it has to mm-hmm. show. But I would say one other thing, sincerity. Mm-hmm. It has to be present and it has to show. And, you know, similar to Natalie's point, right, whether it's on a screen, whether it's in a room, that vibration that we bring when we really show up as our best selves, it cannot, it cannot truly be faked, right? And I think some people still believe in that, that, you know, salesperson that can fake it, right? The used car salesperson, but that's, that doesn't work long term. And I learned that early on, thankfully for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Dantra, one of the things that really stood out to me in everything that you shared was you said one of the main things that you had to do in that moment was as a team, push you out of the way. Mm-hmm. And I I love how you phrase that because I can I can visualize it, but I'm curious, what did that mean for you and the team when they when when you realized we have to push me out of the way? What did that mean you were doing or, or maybe even not doing? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so practically speaking, my role began to shift into true leadership, right? And leadership is about setting that vision, um, painting that picture of where ultimately you believe is the best position for the organization, helping people to understand what are going to be the mile markers to show that you've actually achieved um, something and gotten there. But then giving it to the team, right? Um, Getting out of the way of the how and allowing them to come up with the how and allowing them to come up with the articulation of how that's going to get us there faster and what actually might shift based on the vision that you set for, right? So we did contest. We did fun contest. Uh, We allowed the team to come up with top three initiatives And we allowed ourselves to work toward the metrics that would ultimately make us a high performing operation for the company. And ultimately, after 18 months of success and turning metrics around in an organization that 
um, prior to that had not been participating in the corporate initiatives, we were able to extend our value proposition even greater. So um, we became the operation for customer service for all of the division uh, versus just one segment based on our success. And that was something that we could look around and I could give to my team. It was the team that did it, right? And there was a a bit of camaraderie and pride that went along with that. Chantra, you know what I was thinking about too is that, so as our company has grown, um, I know that me personally, I've had to really work on what it means to be a leader who's no longer doing all the doing, right? Like I've spent most of my life before this company being a great doer. And what the process as it's unfolded for me is that I've had to redefine my value proposition. And some of the leaders we work with who go from individual contributor to leader, I think part of their challenge is that there's a concern about being irrelevant or a concern about not having the right skill set. Like if I've been valued for 20 years as being an awesome contributor and I'm not doing all the doing anymore, what is my value proposition? It's like a move from me shining to developing a shining team. Did you have any of that? I don't know, uncertainty or concern around as you're figuring out what's my new value proposition, how was that for you emotionally, maybe? I'll be honest with you, that part was not hard for me at all. You know, for me, I think there is a natural interest in leaning in and developing others and watching them thrive. And I Mm -hmm. think the best leaders, at least in my life, and certainly, you know, who I began to emerge as coming out of this experience was one who found joy in identifying the talent in others, giving them the tools to be successful and watching them, watching them fly, right? And that's the mindset shift. And I think it's a really important thought that you bring up because first of all, people should be very comfortable and rewarded in the jobs that they do. Not everybody will aspire to or enjoy being a leader, right? Some people Uh will very much be, most fulfilled in being the doer, in being the individual contributor. And I think they're both truly useful and important. But just for a moment, I'll double click on the leadership journey. For those who decide that that's calling them, I think you really almost have to unlearn all of the things that helped you to be successful as a doer, right? You control your cadence and your pace you controlled the output, you controlled all of it, right? And you also controlled the the perfection that you saw in your mind being on the page as the finished result, right? When you shift to leader, that goes away, right? If you're a good leader, if you're a great leader, you're going to relinquish that and you're going to accept again with humility that while you can set forth the vision of where you're going, where you expect to get, it's going to look different. You're going to get there. It's going to look different. Because the minute I tap into five other minds, right, and I give them the task and the challenge to explore and to think and to develop and to deliver, I got to get out of the way. There's nothing more demotivating for a team being led by anyone than having someone empower them and take it away, right? And I think a lot of leaders get that blah, right? They think, okay, I'll lead, I'll give my people the task, um, but then I'm gonna tell them, you know, did you think about, it could have been, it would have been, right? And I've had to learn, and I say this because again, this has been a part of my next level leadership learning, right? When do you actually accept that your way, while it's a great way for you, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way, right? If you're meaning, if you set out the metrics, the measures for success, right? And you're very clear on the what the deliverable is. If someone chooses to do it a different way, it looks a little bit different, but it meets the measures and it's it's the outcome that you intended as at least a check mark, right? But it looks different. You have to be excited. You have to celebrate that, right? And that went through, you know, the part two of my growth, right? I would go on to increase leadership assignments and roles. And then the next lessons for me were all about how do you accept 
when things look a little bit different than what you would have done or what you would have thought, how do you keep a team engaged and motivated? You do not do it by say scratching the page and, you know, sending people back to start all over. Sometimes you accept that good enough is great. Good enough is great. I like that. I like that. Well, I know that, Chantra, one of the things we in our podcast always try to do because while today we're talking about courage, you know, we talk a lot about energy connection and courage and the relationship between those three things. Because while we talk about them as separate words, they're like always all influencing each other. So I would love to hear from your perspective how courage or maybe specifically humility, how does that influence or how is it influenced by individual energy or connection with other people? Yeah, I think about this and I think about courage and I and I think about humility. And there's something that I feel is missing in, in the statement of courage equals humility for me. And that's faith, right? Because I think it's the two. When you have courage, the combination of humility and faith in something that you're being called to, in something within you, in something that you're expecting, that goes together to create the momentum that gets you forward. So as I think about you guys and, and energy and how does that show up, it's not just the vulnerability that comes with, with the humility piece, but it's also not staying there, right? It's being fueled for more. And that's the faithful piece, right? That's the okay brush it off and keep going. So I think, I think for me, that's where, that's where the energy comes from. So the energy for you comes from your deep faith in something greater. And purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chandra, what would you offer to our listeners? Uh, we've talked about a lot of important things today. If you had to choose one big idea that maybe is a big idea, but you could boil it down to kind of like a, a practical little nugget, something people can take away and think about or ponder or do, what would your one big thing for our listeners be? I think at the very end of the day, all of this is around the mindset that we have for our own selves. And I would say, think about your mindset in any situation and allow yourself to give an honest report card, an honest grade on whether your mindset is purely self-motivated, so, you know, internally driven and therefore more closely leaning to the things of pride and arrogance, or is your mindset being shaped by more external things, right? And the impact that you're having outside of yourself, right? Really think about that. And I would even say, bring to mind a couple of experiences that you've had where you either showed courage as you would define it, or maybe didn't show courage as you define it. And ask the honest question, my mindset, was it about what was within me or was it about the impact that I was bringing external to myself? I think that would be a really cool tool. That's a good one. I love that. Thank you. I love that, Sandra. It reminds me so much of encourage work where we talk about perfectionism versus mm -hmm. internal striving. Like our, you know, perfectionism is based on external, what other people think. It's perform, perfect, whereas internal striving is very different and motivated very differently. It reminds me a lot. I love that you put it into the one simple, you know, that simple word of mindset. What is your mindset being driven by? Is it external or internal? So I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. No, well, you're very welcome. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I love it. And and maybe the last thing we'll go into is every time we share something at the end of our podcast, which is like, sometimes we call it the interesting tidbit or the interesting fact or something about each one of us that maybe not other people know. And I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca to go first because I went first oh, last time. <laughs> Ooh, taking off guard. I'm taking well, off we're guard. We're going to be okay. asking that of you, you Chandra. Um, oh, here's a good one. Okay. I mean, I think it's good because it's interesting to me. So my daughter just turned 15 
on Sunday. And she, on Tuesday, I took her to the DMV to get her learner's permit. That's what they call it at the DMV. I just call it a permit. Yeah. So she yeah. had her permit for three days and she's been driving me everywhere and she is an awesome driver. And I am so excited about the fact that pretty soon she's going to be my chauffeur instead of me being hers. I love it. And I, I've told Rebecca many times and I think, Chantra, you're like almost there. I think you're in the same place with your you know, your youngest son. Yeah. It's when when the kids learn to drive themselves, life changing. Yeah, life-changing. absolutely life changing. I don't even know what to share today on a on a Friday afternoon today when I'm my my brain is a little fried today. But maybe I don't think I've shared this one before. But Beck, you can correct me. I've worked in this industry of you know overall of around human behavior and human performance my whole life, except for one small bout. Where I decided. I didn't want to work in this industry. I was very young. I was still in college and I want to go do something different. And I went and worked for about a year and a half in film. And my job was organizing and working with film festivals all over Florida. I worked for a company called Fife, Florida Institute for Film Education. And I organized film festivals and worked with actors and went to Universal Studios and did this thing for like a year and a half and then changed my mind and came back. That's super cool. I did not know that. Yeah, so something a little different. (laughs) And for any of our listeners who know Natalie, you'll know that actually that kind of tracks in one way because it's entertainment, it's people, it's events. Like, I can totally see you doing that. I'm glad you came back to this industry, but I can totally see you doing that. Chantra, what about you? Well, so let's see. Um, So here I am. In the nuttiest of nuttiest boardrooms in the last few years, and I am doing so much yoga to stay oh. balanced and to stay centered. So much yoga. Like, literally, I'm leaving the office, ripping clothes off so that I can change and want to do the yoga. And they say that they're going to have a yoga teacher training. And for a second, I was like, am I trying to do that? And then I was like, nah. And so then I'm at the yoga studio on a Saturday morning, and the owner comes up and he says, you know, we're doing this yoga teacher training. I think you should do it. You know, my big girl job is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you that. But I think you should do the training. And I was like, you know think about it. And because I was spending so much time doing it and because I was in the nuttiest of nuttiest boardroom situations, I said, you know what? What could be the harm? I'm going to do it. 200 hours of yoga teacher training. It was intense. It was insane. It was life-changing. It was amazing. And I can tell you that it is the single thing that I have done in this um, next phase of my leadership journey to allow me to be so much more authentic and clear thinking and articulate and okay when things work and when things don't. So I am a trained yoga teacher. That's my dad. I love it. I thought your story was going to, okay, I decided I'm going to do it, but you're done. You did it. Oh yeah, I did it. Yeah, that was in 2019. It's done. In the Ah. works. Oh, I did not know that. That was a good one. That's huge, Chandra. I know a couple people that have been through a multi-hundred hour yoga teacher's training, and I've heard that from all of them. It's pretty intense. It's what an accomplishment. Cool. Yeah. Well, Chandra, this was so great. We love that you spent some time with us. This was a great conversation and really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. I am so grateful to you both. Thank you for thinking of me and sharing your airwaves with me and I hope to see you both soon. Thank you, Chantra. I will see you soon. We're going to make it happen. Yes. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of Energy Connection and Courage. And we look forward to being with you again soon. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. To learn more, head over to peopleforwardnetwork.com. And of course, hit that follow button.